morning. I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, before we get started, I would uh, like to ask everybody to please rise and join me in a salute to the flag. Hand over heart, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for a moment of silence for those who were killed on 9-11 18 years ago today and for the men and women serving in the armed forces who are protecting our liberty and our freedom. Please be seated. <clears throat> Good morning again. On behalf of Joseph Torregrosa, Chairman of the Board of Fire Commissioners from Franklin Square, I'd like to welcome you. He couldn't make it today. He is ill. He's suffering from the, uh, from the toxins that were breathed in during the uh, rescue and recovery efforts down at uh, Ground Zero 18 years ago today. My name is Christopher Joya, and I'm a fire commissioner with the Franklin Square and Munson Fire District in the town of Franklin Square, New York, Nassau County, which is near the Queens border. I'm a Marine Corps veteran, and I have been an active volunteer firefighter with the Franklin Square and Munson Fire Department for 33 years. I am also a former EMT and an ex-chief, having served five years in that position. I am currently employed as a construction surveyor with Local 15 Operating Engineers, New York City. And I have worked in the heavy construction industry for the past 30 years, specializing in reinforced concrete, major foundation work, and structural steel. Today I am here to announce the launching of our Justice for 9-11 Heroes campaign which is being spearheaded by the Franklin Square and Munson Fire District. On the morning of September 11, 2001, I was working on the Brooklyn side of the East River, just north of the Williamsburg Bridge, and had a spectacular view of Manhattan and the Twin Towers. Having been an eyewitness to the attacks that day, and from being called to duty to assist the Fire Department of New York in the following days and weeks afterwards, 9-11 has never been far from my thoughts, having been burned forever into my soul. The 9-11 Commission concluded that Osama bin Laden and a group of Islamic extremists were responsible and carried out the attacks, and that was to be the end of it. Truth be told, that is far from the end of it. The 9-11 Commission was flawed, and in the words of two of its own, the chairman and the vice chairman of the 9-11 Commission, respectively, Thomas Keene and Lee Hamilton, who stated in their book, without precedent, that they were set up to fail and were starved of funds to do a proper investigation. That's their own words. They also confirmed that they were denied access to the truth and misled by senior officials in the Pentagon and the Federal Aviation Authority and that this obstruction and deception led them to contemplate slapping officials with criminal charges. The final report did not examine key evidence and neglected serious anomalies in the various accounts of what happened. The commissioners themselves admit their report was incomplete and flawed and that many questions about the terror attacks remain unanswered. Nevertheless, the 9-11 Commission was swiftly closed down on August 21st, 2004. The failings of the official investigation have fueled too many half-baked conspiracy theories. Some of the 9-11 truth groups promote speculative hypotheses, ignore innocent explanations, cite non-expert sources and jump to conclusions that are not proven by the known facts. They convert mere coincidence and circumstantial evidence into cast iron proof. This is no way to 
debunked the obfuscations and evasions of the 9-11 report. But even amidst the hype, some of these 9-11 groups, including architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth, pilots for 9-11 Truth, and the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry, to name a few, raise valid and important questions that were never even considered, let alone answered, by the official investigation. The bottom line here is that the American public has not been told the complete truth about the events of that fateful autumn morning 18 years ago. What happened on 9-11 is fundamentally important, but equally important is the way the 9-11 cover-up signifies an absence of democratic, transparent, and accountable government. Establishing the truth is, in part, about restoring honesty and trust and confidence in the American political system. That is why, on July 24th of this year, the Franklin Square Munson Fire District voted unanimously to adopt a legal resolution of support for the special federal grand jury investigation before the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York. The almost 3,000 innocent people who were murdered right before our eyes that day cannot speak. So it is left up to us to speak for them and demand that their voices be heard in a court of law with subpoena power and an impartial jury to consider all of the evidence by placing 9-11 under a microscope and investigating everything and anything down to the smallest of details with the same veracity as the recent Mueller investigation into Russian collusion and not before a commission of political appointees who had the rules dictated to them by some of the very people who were being investigated or who had conflicts of interest and which should have led to several members of the commission to recuse themselves. I demand to know, as should everyone, especially the media, why important testimony from, made that day from over 150 police, firefighters, and first responders regarding explosions wasn't included in the commission report, nor investigated further. Why did the FBI, why didn't the FBI or NIST examine the wreckage for explosives? Why wasn't Ground Zero considered a crime scene and sealed off and processed accordingly? Why was crucial evidence of melted structural steel suppressed and not even considered or worse yet, allowed to be carted off and destroyed? Why won't, after 18 years, mainstream media such as ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, or Fox News, and if Fox News here, I, I take that back and I apologize, <laughs> <laughs> report on any of this, let alone ask the hard questions of how and why certain things occurred the way they did, especially and the collapse of the third World, World Trade Center building, building number seven, that most people don't even know about. And finally, why can't Americans hear about FDNY Battalion Chief Oreo Palmer, who succeeded in making it to the point of impact on the 78th floor of the South Tower with his men and reported that he had two isolated pockets of fire and that we should be able to knock it down with two lines. So he made it up to the fire floor and he saw what was going on. And, and, contradiction, and contradicting the, uh, the official storyline that it was a raging fire up there, here's, here's a brave fireman who made it onto the fire floor and was doing his job. One minute after the final transmission, the South Tower collapsed. Why can't Americans hear about that it took a lawsuit under the Freedom of Information Act by the New York Times to get the fire department tapes released so that the public could hear exactly what the firefighters said? This occurring in August of 2005, 
almost exactly a year after 9-11 Commission had disbanded. That is not justice. Being in Washington today, I'll put a perspective on in terms of the cost of the 9-11 investigation and money spent on other government investigations. The Mueller investigation cost about $25 million. The Whitewater investigation cost about 60 to $70 million. The Space Shuttle Challenger disaster cost about $175 million and seven astronauts killed. The Space Shuttle Columbia disaster cost about $400 million and seven astronauts killed. 9-11 Commission was initially given $3 million and a deadline of 18 months to complete with a final cost of about $15 million and the Commission's conclusion was that it was a failure of imagination that led to 9-11 happening. Imagine that. The worst act of terrorism in the history of our country, which claimed almost 3,000 innocent lives and which dramatically altered the course of our nation and the world, and it had an imposed deadline and of just 18 months, which was extended by two months, and it had an initial budget of just $3 million. Remember what the chairman and vice chairman of the 9-11 Commission said. They were set up to fail and they were starved of funds to do a proper investigation. Who could have imagined that, given the magnitude of such an atrocity? So it would seem, until now, that we have left unmolested those who set fire to the house and prosecuted those who sounded the alarm. But that is changing. People lie, but the facts don't. All the American people want now, after 18 years, is the truth based on the facts and the remaining forensic evidence and what can be proved in a court of law. That is why we, were we are here today. 343 firefighters, including three of my good friends, Thomas Hetzel, Bobby Evans, and Mike Kiefer, perished that day. And these were some of the best and the bravest people in the world. And they, along with the rest of those who were murdered and died horrible deaths, deserve justice. At this time, I'd like to introduce Bob McElvain, a father of Bobby McElvain, who was killed by an explosion in the lobby of the North Tower. Mr. Mr. McElvain. Good job. If I, if I get emotional, just ignore me. Anyways, so I, I just, I, I didn't really, I didn't want to prepare anything because maybe I can just ad lib. I have a lot to say. I've been doing this for day one. Day one after Bobby died, I didn't believe the story. You know, I just never did. So I've been on this search. I, I feel I have closure in my inner self because I know what happened. And obviously, I don't have the time to go into who did it. My, and my main concern in life now is why was it done? And I always say you really, truly, truly have to understand history to understand what happened on 9-11. And you have to follow history. You know, I've gone back to the, I've spent more time in World War I than anything. Why in the world do we have such a disaster? World War II, the 50s, the 60s, Iran-Contra. You know, Iran-Contra is a big thing. To me, I link that with 9-11, but I really won't get into that. So, you know, I've been doing it forever. On 9-11, Bobby, you know, convinced, I know for sure that he died before the towers were hit. So I say 940, I don't know exactly what it was, 946. Uh, just because we took him home, what, two days after 9-11, and we buried him the following week. Uh, he was found immediately. He, uh, we took him, he was in the morgue before the buildings came down. 
But so I've spent all this time, you know, what happened to him? You know, and again, I didn't believe his story. So we're, we're talking about demolitions. We're talking about, you know, uh, you know, what happened to the buildings. And of course, the official story is plane hit that, you know, I'm just speaking of the North Tower. And because of Richard Gage, over the years, I've had a very difficult time with 9-11 family members. Because the biggest problem of 9-11, people talking about it, is who did it. And it just goes from one person to another, to this or that, did Bush do it, did Cheney do it, to, you know, the secret state, the secret team, you know, it just goes on and on and on and on. And it's very important. But mine is that these buildings were purposely demolished. I think even thinking about the planes, take that out of your mind. These buildings were blown up. The idea was to blow up the buildings. Planes had nothing to do with it. That was for show, and I don't want to diminish what happened to the people who died because of the planes, but that was all for show. So get that out of your mind, and you have to do your research. Why was this done? But getting back to the buildings, uh, the 9-11 Commission, now I made every 99.9% .9 of the commission hearings, and it was a joke. And at first I was trying to be very attentive, and I think uh, it was after Condoleezza Rice. And if, I wish I could have punched her in the mouth. I was so upset. That's when I said, I was, I was working with 9-11 Family for Peaceful Memoirs. For, I went to Japan. We, I was a, a real anti-war activist. After listening to Condoleezza Rice, I said, I'm devoting my life to this, finding out what happened, who murdered my son, Bobby. She stood up there and filibustered her way through the, the commission hearing. So after that, I had interviews, and I just I lost my temper to everyone I spoke to. So since then, I have an awful temper about that. I can't deal with 9-11 family members because they don't want to hear what I have to say, and I don't blame them. But I, I don't like being up at ground zero today. My son's up there now, but I can't stand it because a couple of years ago, someone started screaming at me that I would say such a thing that Muslims, I, I would tell her, Muslims had nothing to do with Bobby's death. Bobby died before the plane hit. So how can I say Muslims had anything to do with my death? And how many millions and millions and millions and millions of people have died in the Middle East because of this? Now, getting back to the commission report, this is what the commission had to say about um, the building coming down. I won't spend that much time. A jet fuel fireball erupted upon impact and shot down at least one bank of elevators. The fireball exploded onto numerous lower floors, including the 77th and 22nd, West Street lobby levels, and the B4 level, four stories below. Well, that's the biggest crock you've ever heard in your life. They spent maybe 30 seconds making that up. They did no investigation. So that's, my son was murdered. They spent no time investigating what happened in those buildings, zero. They didn't talk about the 22nd, 23rd, 24th, and 25th where the FBI had investigations going there that no one knew about. Why were they, those floors were demolished before the planes were hit? Why is that? That was even on uh, Peter Jennings' show. 60 Minutes did a, a show on that. And what are we doing? No one hears this. Of course, that's shut down. No one talks about it. The press don't talk about it. Doesn't talk about it. So it's, it's just people have to do their homework. They have to, to believe. And, and again, that's where going back to history. Why would they blow up the buildings? Well, there's a lot of research that goes into it. I don't have the time to talk about that. But it was a, that was the crime, blowing up the buildings. And I really don't care what country, what people were involved in it. It's an international event. It's the Western Empire. That's what they do. That's what they do best. Human lives don't matter. So it really helped me. I don't have to get into arguments anymore. Richard came up doing what he's doing. I don't know when he came up, but what, 2005? Six. Six. It made it easy for me. Because now I just say, Bobby was killed by an explosion. Bobby died before the planes hit. So we got a big time problem. Mm -hmm. Who blew up these damn buildings? And, but people keep coming up with their own theories. That's what's killing the thing, the, the whole movement, I think. But Richard makes it very easy for me. You know, building seven, it's obvious. That was, that's a controlled demolition. So that's why I stick to that story. Bobby was married, and I, you know, I'll gladly, if I'm in, you know, in a bar with someone, if they really want to talk about it, I'll talk, I don't go to bars anymore, but I, uh, 
you know, I'll gladly talk to them, and it would, you know, I, I think I don't have to teach a college course because it, you really do have to understand history, that this is what empires do. So I'm not blaming it on the United States, I'm not blaming it on Israel. Hey, they're all part of it. And you can figure out why, and to me it was a financial crime, but we can get to, there were so many other reasons, oil, so forth and so on. But I'm happy with it, I feel good about it. And again, architects and engineers have made it so easy for me because I don't have to go into all those realms. Bobby was murdered, and the most important thing for me to say, Muslims had nothing, zero, to do with Bobby's murder, period. Okay. Thank you, Bob. I'd like to call up Richard Gage, AIA architect and founder of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. Thank you. I represent 3,000 architects and engineers across the country and around the world who are demanding a new investigation. If 3,000 architects and engineers signed a statement to you saying that your house was in danger of collapse, would you listen to them? That's 25,000 years of technical credibility. Why did they sign the petition calling for a new investigation? Over the last 12 years, we've been assembling the evidence that's been provided from official sources, like the US Geological Survey, who documents molten iron microspheres in all the World Trade Center dust. Where do they come from? How did they get to be molten? Extreme temperatures exceeding 2,800 degrees is what's required for that phenomena and the pools of molten iron, including pouring out of the South Tower minutes prior to its collapse. Why does a team of scientists find nanothermite chips, red-gray chips in all the World Trade Center dust? Why did FEMA document in their May 2002 Building Performance Assessment Report in their limited uh, metallurgical examination of the steel hot temperature corrosion attack on the steel with sulfur. Sulfur is added to thermite to become thermate, much more effective at cutting through steel. The military uses it to cut through steel like a hot knife through butter. Why is this found throughout all the World Trade Center dust as well? Why did the towers come down in 12 seconds completely shattered from top to bottom? Why are there isolated explosive ejections emitted out of the towers 20, 40, 60 stories down below what we're told is a gravitational collapse? Why does that not look like a gravitational collapse, but an ejection, a geometry of fireworks with four ton and eight ton structural steel sections ejected laterally at 80 miles an hour, landing 800 feet in every direction? Physicists clock this material and it is not gravity that's at work here. We're talking about high energy explosives and evidence of thermite and nanothermite in the towers. Why do 156 first responders talk about the evidence of explosions, being in explosions, hearing explosions, seeing explosions, flashes of light seeing them, many of them. And most of that before the towers collapsed. Why is there a third tower that no, hardly any architects and engineers know about? I'm talking about the third worst structural failure in modern history. World Trade Center Building 7, part of the World Trade Center complex wasn't hit by an airplane. After witnesses hear explosions, this building drops like a rock, straight down, uniformly, symmetrically, into its own footprint in under seven seconds, in the exact manner of a classic controlled demolition. 
And yet, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, who was tasked by Congress to explain this collapse to the American people, said seven years later, when everybody forgot about it, those who knew about it, oh, normal office fires brought this building down. Well, wait, these are few, small, and scattered fires in this building, presumably caused when the North Tower next to it went down. Well, office fires have never brought down a skyscraper before 9-11, ever. But controlled demolition has brought down dozens and dozens and dozens. And it looks exactly like that. So that should have been the first hypothesis examined by NIST. And yet, it was relegated to a set of frequently asked questions years later, very frequently asked. And they said, no, uh, we, we, uh, we, we didn't find evidence of explosive residue. And, and years later than that, they write in writing, uh, admit in writing, we never looked for evidence of explosive residue. You can't find what you're not looking for. Well, there's a problem with Building 7. And the University of Alaska was made aware of this problem and finally convinced to take a deeper look at Building 7. And they said, well, gosh, we have fires bringing a building down for the first time ever at free fall acceleration, as fast as a bowling ball falling out of the sky. Maybe we should look at this because there's hundreds of similarly designed buildings in a country and around the world. That's what convinced Professor Leroy Halsey, chair of the Civil Engineering Department at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks, to look at this. One of the top forensic structural engineers in the country. This study was released about four or five days ago. It's available on our website for you to download. And it's called A Structural Reevaluation of the Collapse of World Trade Center 7. It's a major university study that I highly recommend you download uh, on our website, ae911truth.org. The science behind the study, to rule out scenarios that would not cause the collapse of Building 7, and to identify the types of failures that could have caused the collapse. The data is open. You can download the data and review it. It's not hidden in a black box like NIST's computer modeling data, because we submitted a Freedom of Information Act request saying, we'd like to see the data, because it's not classified. So they have to release it, but they have an out. What's the out? It might jeopardize public safety. <laughs> How could it jeopardize public safety to withhold this data from the architects and engineers who are responsible with ensuring the public safety? So this study is open to peer review, unlike the NIST report. So they simulated the local structural responses to fire loading on floor 13, because that's where NIST focused its initiation of collapse theory for Building 7. They examined NIST's collapse initiation hypothesis, and they simulated numerous uh, failure scenarios that would lead to the collapse of Building 7. What they found is a series of manipulations and assumptions that are invalid and I would call fraudulent, including making the exterior wall of the building infinitely stiff so that it would force the movement, the thermal movement of the slab under fire loading conditions away from the wall, pushing this girder off of its seat on this column 79, and then it falls and in their scenario causes a cascading collapse because four, uh, nine floors are, are, have failed. And then that, that leaves column 79 unbraced so it buckles. And that causes the complete failure all the way up to the east penthouse 
in, in less than 10 seconds. And then in another 10 seconds, this failure works its way across this football field sized building. And then we see the collapse that you can see on YouTube just by Googling Building 7 Collapse. Uniformly symmetric, symmetrical free fall acceleration for a third of its seven second fall. What else did they find? They found that NIST omitted key structural components, such as omitting the side plates on the side of column 79, which would have trapped the girder, keeping it from falling off of its seat. They omitted the stiffeners that would have stiffened the flanges under that girder, keeping them from folding up, because NIST says it only had to fall, be pushed halfway off of its seat, and then the flange folded. So they conveniently omitted those stiffeners. So that flange could fold. So that girder could fall. But they also found that even if that girder fell, it only had a third of the weight and the impact load on the floor below, which would be required to break the girder below it, because there's three massive girders down there. They omitted the shear studs on the top of this girder, which would have ever would kept it from ever moving off of its seat. All this is in the shop drawings. So it's a very obvious, beyond misinformation here, beyond the, the uh, this is deliberate. Now, the study doesn't, doesn't make those points. He's very conservative, Professor Halsey. He, as, as a PhD and his team of PhD uh, researchers, have concluded, based on their computer modeling, because they, they said, okay, NIST assumptions are, most of them, invalid. Wow. Well, let's use them anyway and see what happens in our computer model, which, by the way, is generations ahead of what NIST used in their computer model 15 years ago. So they found that using those assumptions, there's no failure. There's no local failure, even using the missing components and the exterior wall infinitely stiff. They found that they had to take out eight columns in that area in order for the building to fail. And then it tips. It doesn't come down uniformly. What do they have to do? Now we're at year three and a half of this $300,000 study. To get this building to collapse the way the video shows it. They had to remove not eight, not 10, not 100, but 650 columns over eight floors within a second or so of each other. By God, then the building drops like a rock straight down uniformly symmetrically, just like the videos show. So the conclusion is, this is not a progressive collapse. They failed. NIST. It's a global collapse initiated by the simultaneous failure of hundreds of columns all at once, virtually. This study pulls the rug out from the NIST study of the most important collapse in United States history, outside perhaps the Twin Towers. And it needs to be delivered to every university across the country and around the world, especially given how many similarly built buildings there are out there that are subject to free fall collapse after a few hours of randomly scattered fires. That's why we're here today. That's what we've introduced into the legal system, thanks to the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry, who's taken our evidence and this study to the next level. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. I'd like to introduce the president and executive director and a former police officer with 29 years, 20, 23 years with the New, New Brunswick Police Department in New Jersey. Uh, 
the executive director of the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 in Inquiry, David Meiswinkel. Thank you for being here. We can easily forgive a child who was afraid of the dark. The real tragedy of life is when men are afraid of the light. That was said 2,500 years ago by Plato. I applaud the media that's here. This reference is in, to those that aren't here, that have never been here. On 9-11, the most egregious act was perpetrated against the citizens of the United States of America. It had worldwide ramifications. In this country, there has never been a criminal investigation that resulted in a grand jury at least to our knowledge, until the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry filed last April a petition, 54 pages, 57 exhibits, to the U.S. Attorney's Office in New York City. And we filed that up with an amended petition to add additional bombing charges in November, we received from the U.S. Attorney, Jeffrey Berman, a letter acknowledging receipt of our grand jury petition and exhibits, saying that he read and reviewed and he would comply with the law regarding the submission. The law is 18 U.S.C. 3332A which mandates him, I underline mandates him, to call a special grand jury to consider the evidence before him. That evidence, much of it, was gathered over many years by architects and engineers. The evidence is dispositive. In legal jargon, dispositive means no-brainer. It means all other possibilities have been eliminated, that when you look at this and analyze it, the only conclusion you can have, because all doubt has been removed, is that explosives, incendiaries, and controlled demolition were involved in bringing the towers down. Now, you heard Commissioner Joya Talk about one of his colleagues, Royal Palmer. These firemen, these valiant firemen, went up over 70 floors, risked their lives. They had another line or two to be brought up. They were next to the fire, above the fire, in the area of the fire, about to put it out. You can imagine what must have been going on with those perhaps responsible for this action, thinking they put it out, what's the explanation to bring the towers down? They couldn't put it out. or wouldn't be allowed to put it out because the official story, the official government story, is office fires brought the towers down or office fires caused by jet fuel, and as Richard Gage told you, President of Architects and Engineers, Building 7, another giant skyscraper, the third one, was not hit by an airplane. There was no fuel involved from a jet airliner, but that came down for 100 feet, eight floors or more, at free fall rate. Free fall means there's nothing under it. And as, as Richard Gage explained, nothing's under it. 
all the columns simultaneously being taken out, falling down in its footprint, there's only one conclusion. Now, we submitted this petition giving the U.S. Attorney this evidence, and we've waited for his reply, hoping that he's acting in good faith because it seemed like he was. At least he gave us a letter. Now, when we received that letter, I'd like to say that we were invited into the castle because for all these years, the truth has been out there, but it seemed like the official story was blocking the truth. And now the truth was going to be presented to a grand jury, which is 16 to 23 impartial folks, just like yourself, that can use your reason, logic, and common sense and look at what we present. And when you see it, you'll walk away and you'll say, explosions, bombs, controlled demolition, incendiaries. Now you can grasp that if you go on the Lawyers Committee website, lc4911.org, lc4for911.org. And all the exhibits are listed there. The, uh, Petitions listed there. We submitted to the U.S. Attorney a people with material information that they should contact. And there's two versions, one for the grand jurors and one for the public where, because of certain legal uh, reasons, if we start mentioning particular names, that would not be smart for us <laughs> because we're just making suggestions to the U.S. Attorney. Now, we had not heard from them, so in July we called them, Mick Harrison, legal director of the Lawyers Committee, litigation director, and myself. We talked to Michael Ferreira, chief of terrorism, international narcotics in the Southern District. He was uh, very respectful. He told us he could not disclose whether they have, are conducting a grand jury investigation at this time because it's all secret. Well, we don't buy that because we've done our homework and we see that they could give us some ministerial records and possibly substantive records. So on Friday, a few days ago, we sued. The Lawyers Committee has sued the uh, U.S. Attorney, William Barr, and the U.S. Attorney in the Southern District, Jeffrey Berman. Now, in March, we were down in Washington, and we filed another suit at that time. And that was a suit because the uh, FBI had not followed a congressional uh, a order, basically, to assess any information, 9-11 related, that was not originally considered by the 9-11 Commission. And uh, we had seven areas. The first area that they never assessed was the area that Richard Gage was talking about, the explosive evidence that exists. The FBI has never looked at it. The second area that we told them was reference to the high fivers identified later as Israeli nationals that were seen and arrested in New Jersey for filming and congratulating apparently themselves or being happy about the event as it was happening. And the third count was a destruction of evidence because under a Freedom of Information Act, we asked the federal government for those photos and they told us that they may have been destroyed in uh, 2014, at about the same time, Congress was ordering them to assess all available information related to 9-11. So we sued under the Open Public Records Act in New Jersey because the state police developed the film and there was reports that there was explosive residue on the fabric in a blanket that they confiscated. That's on appeal right now. We've been able to get at least a log entry that we argue is reflective of those photos. Of course, the state in New Jersey says they're not, 
but the log entry says World Trade Center bombing, terrorism, confiscated film, and it's the same date that the photo transcript we have. We have a we have a an order, a FBI declassified uh, piece of uh, document that indicates the FBI received these photos from New Jersey State Police on September 13, 2001. We have a log entry referencing that, what we think it is, but so far it's been denied, all right? So that's some of the things that, 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 that we're doing, the Lawyers Committee, uh, and there's a lot of others, and I won't go into it, it'll take up too much time. But, uh, yeah, so I'm gonna sum it up right now uh, if you're interested in what I'm saying, lc4911.org. And I'll sum it up the way I started it. We can easily forgive a child who is afraid of the dark. The real tragedy of life is when men are afraid of the light. Thank you for being here. David. Okay, at this time we have a few moments left. Uh, we will entertain any questions from the audience and or the uh, press. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I need to ask this question because I was certainly infuriated when I heard uh, in the lead up to the, the, the culmination of the Mueller investigation, there were people, especially congressmen and women, who likened the 9-11 Russia gave to the 9-11 attack. They said, we, we were attacked like we were on 9-11. Did, did you have a reaction or a, a gut feeling when you heard that? Uh, comparison to the, uh, to the one to the other? Yeah, how, how could they possibly <clears throat> at, at this point, get, get away with comparing something where nobody died at all or was it, injured to the worst Yes, Ms. Mr. McIlvain would like to, an to answer that question, please. Yeah, I, I personally think it's the biggest crock you've ever seen in your entire life. Mueller, to me, is at the top of my list for perpetrators of 9-11. His job, his only job forever has been to cover up any, everything. He works for what you call the deep state. So his job is to bring down Trump. I'm not a Trump fan by any stretch of the imagination. But he was, in, you know, and same thing with Barr, both of them. Iran-Contra is a big thing. You know, that, that's when the enterprise realized they can do anything they want. Well, Barr and Mueller were so big a part of that to cover it up. And then when did uh, Mueller start his job? 9-11, or after 9-11, what, two days after 9-11? That's his job to cover that up. As I was telling my wife coming in here, I was in the FBI building once when I was with the Jersey girls. And I, this is one of the things with my breaking points, I lost my temper listening to that jerk. And he is a jerk. So the 9-11 the, the or the Russia Gate thing is just a, uh, to me, a ruse. And Mueller is, you know, he's not trying, you know, he just does what he's told. I mean, that's my, that's not a feeling. I mean, I, it's just from the way I've dealt with him. All right, thanks. Anybody? Any other questions? Anything? Yes, sir. I was just up in New York at the Trade Center site, and uh, I asked NYPD present on the uh, area of the, uh, you know, where the event happened, and also uh, Port Authority Police, if it would be okay to distribute literature as per architects and engineers for 9-11 truth, and I was told no, the distribution of literature like that would be prohibited, I'd be cited, uh, taken to court, arrested. Uh, could you please speak to the port, of, director of the Port Authority, and uh, so that people who are trying to advocate transparency about this could uh, at least distribute literature to, to all those who are visiting the Trade Center site? I, I most certainly agree with you. I think that you know we're covered under our constitutional rights that we have the right to do that, and that for somebody to say that, that uh, you know, I would just say, hey, here's 
show them the copy of the Constitution. I can hand out whatever I want, you know? They, they asserted that the Port Authority is a private owner of that space. And, and the, although they own it privately, they allow public access, but with limitations as if the First Amendment doesn't apply. So thank you for your, your efforts, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, hey, sir. Mr. Commissioner and Richard, why do you think it's right now there's a height of the presidential push going for the next presidential election? Why don't you think that the presidential candidates ever get asked or they, on their own ever talk about 9-11? I think that uh, that a couple of the candidates have been asked. I, I believe uh, that question has been brought up. I'm not uh, fully familiar with what exactly they were asked, but I, to, to the best of my knowledge, I think they were, a couple of them. And they did respond in a positive fashion. Richard, yes. please. Uh, thank you. Um, we have a program uh, to survey candidates. And uh, if you tune into our website, ae911truth.org, you'll find out how you can assist in that program. And uh, so uh, also, by the way, um, you can help us uh, to distribute uh, our petition, our evidence, uh, the, the Alaska study that we've just been talking about to members of Congress today. We're going to meet at the reflecting pool, which is on which side of the Capitol? West, west side of the Capitol at the reflecting pool at 1215. Yeah, so, so those of you who are here uh, or can uh, come from elsewhere to help us, meet us there, 1215 Reflecting Pool, west side of the Capitol. Thank you. Uh, sir, in the back. Uh, Mike Berger, 911truth.org. I have a question for the lawyers today. Could you talk about um, including like the low-cap domestic hearings of the black boxers on the flights 11 and 175? Right. What, what we want to do, and it's interesting, you, yeah, would you, have we looked into the disappearance of the black boxes from 175 and what well, you said, 11. Flight 11? Exactly. Right. What we're, uh, well, we were looking into all the different areas. We haven't in particularly uh, done a lot of research in that area, all right, as far as the black boxes. Uh, my understanding is they really were recovered and there was denials. That's my personal understanding. But the Lawyers Committee is interested in starting grand jury petitions, not only in New York City, which we're talking about, but in Pennsylvania, Shanksville, down here in Washington, and a giant uh, a, a grand jury which would uh, be based on an obstruction by the government allowing this to happen. And we want to extend ourselves, and we have, to Bill Benny and Kurt Wiebe. These are former whistleblowers from the NSA. And for all the whistleblowers, who could be involved in this as exhibits with statements as to what they were doing and why they were persecuted and then tie it all together. So it's a really good question. As we go forward, we need to generate funds so we can get more investigations going. But that's certainly a key one, not only in New York City, but in all the areas as far as the anal analysis of, of black box, you know, black boxes. Did they disappear? And if they were found, are they accurate or have they been doctored? Okay, thank you. Right, any other questions? Yes, sir. Last question. Uh, a few years ago, Kevin Ryan documented that, to his knowledge, and that investigated the literature, that there was no case of uh, fire code anywhere in the world that was adjusted based upon this tweet. Uh, is, is that still the case? That is, the events of 9-11 and the official conspiracy story is the case that the lesson from that has never been That is absolutely a true statement. They did not modify the fire code because of 9-11. And guess what? Uh, they did not, uh, the uniform uh, building code was not modified. The international building code was not modified to structurally, to improve structural connections and performance that would keep a skyscraper from falling out of the sky at free fall. Uh, no structural modifications to the, the code as a result of the 9-11. There were some recommended by NIST. They were never adopted. They know their buildings are safe. Um, also, um, I wanted to let you, you guys know who are with us locally today that um, we're meeting at uh, 6 p.m. Uh, is at La Merche Restaurant. If you want to hear more from the fire commissioner and myself, 
uh, and possibly even Dave, who might be still in town. Um, that um, uh, address, Diana, is is that the right time? 6 p.m. 6:30 p.m. tonight. Louder. 1736 Connecticut Avenue Northwest DuPont Circle area and Metro at 630 awesome and um, join us there and thanks everybody so much right, do you have some you. comments yeah. I want to thank you all for coming I just wanted to expand I had a chance to think about what you said and I, uh, in regards to the two investigation I just think it's a pathetic attempt by anybody to link any other investigation with the 9-11 investigation. It wouldn't even have been thought of back, back, back then to compare anything to 9-11. It, it's, it's, it's just That's pathetic right. and it just, it's just being disingenuous about things. But thank you very much for uh, coming today.